Um, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to ask our sister Emerald to pray for all of us and especially the speaker. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Janice. Um, Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for everyone here today, Lord, even as we have gathered, Lord Jesus. Lord, indeed, we want to hear from you, Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you bless Rebecca, Lord Jesus, that you be her mouthpiece and that you guide her as well, Lord, and whatever you'd like her to share, Lord, to us, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, Lord, to come to us wherever we are, Lord Jesus. Come and fill our hearts, come and fill our houses, come and fill our rooms, Lord Jesus. And we just want to dedicate this time to you. Bless Rebecca, even as she shares your word, Lord Jesus. Bless everyone here today as well, Lord, as we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Emerald. Now, tonight we have a very special young lady. Um, if you've seen the poster for her talk, um, her name is Rebecca Joy. And she is a joy indeed. And uh, even as I got to know her to prepare uh, for this uh, talk, she just radiates joy, I think so. Um, she has a very illustrious um, career so far. But as I read this, I know she's going to make faces. Um, she was a former assistant, a special assistant to uh, YB Hannah Yo. And after that job, she joined Epic Homes to help build as, uh, homes and serve the Orang Asti community and also provide training to them. And after uh, nine years away from home, um, her hometown is Kamama. And after nine years in 2020, last year, she felt the Lord call her back to Kamama. Um, and she has been praying and crying out to the Lord for East Coast. If you don't know where Kamaman is, it's in Trunganu near Kuantan on the East Coast of Malaysia. Um, and she founded the Shiloh House of Prayer. Now, I said she, she may, well, she didn't make any faces. <laughs> but she was telling me this does not sound like her at all. All these um, interesting jobs and things that she did. But she says... Um, that sounds like somebody else. And let me bring Rebecca Joy. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, Rebecca Joy. Yes, hi, Janice. Hi. Thanks so much for um, being willing to speak to us. I know you have um, a great story to tell. And everyone, um, this is the first time she's going to be sharing some parts of her life journey. Yeah. So please be praying for her. So Rebecca Joy, how are you feeling now? How are you feeling? I am very, very excited. Nervous, but I prefer to think that it is because of the excitement. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so you have the floor. I'm going to give this time to you to share what God has put on your heart. Thank you so much, Janice. And yeah, Janice, uh, um, just now, as you were mentioning, you know, Rebecca Joy, like joy, she radiates joy. And I just feel like that is just such an interesting thing and a reminder that joy is my name and it is my identity. And I, I just, so today for today's sharing, I am just going to share a little bit with, with all of you about my past, where I am right now and what the Lord has put in my heart, um, just to share with you. So I grew up in Kamaman. Uh, in a Christian family but since I was at a very young age I struggled so much with pain I had a very deep sense of brokenness in my life and I struggled with the thought that I, sh I struggled so much with the thought of feeling just very worthless and didn't know why I was alive it felt it, it always felt to me that my life was just a huge mistake. And I struggled all throughout my childhood um, until I reached the age of 16, where the pain became so overwhelming for me that I started to cut myself to relieve the pain that I was feeling on the inside. And that was just um, what my childhood sort of looked like. But at the age of 20 was when 
there was a shift in my life and that was when I met Jesus and I saw the beauty of who he is and that forever transformed me as a person. So when I was 20, uh, I was in Dongling attending the three-month course that we had. And so it was during one of those courses where we were studying the Song of Songs and we were studying the Song of Songs and the love and the pursuit of that bridegroom king. So at that point in my life, I have never known what it meant to be truly pursued. I didn't know what it meant to be truly loved. But when I heard sitting in that teaching, when I heard about the beauty of Jesus, when I heard about the pursuit of him over someone like me who is so unworthy, never felt like I was beautiful or anyone would want to be with me because um, throughout my <laughs> primary school year up to secondary school year as well, I was always bullied because I was very, very overweight. At about 13 years old, I was about 90 kgs. And so I always felt very ugly and I wanted to hide. But that was that perspective of Jesus that he who is so beautiful would want to be with someone like me. And I just fell in love, just completely head over heels at the age of 20. And I was just like, Jesus, I, I give my life to you. My goodness, this is my destiny. He is my destiny. And I would give my life to being that. So like my ambition, usually people have ambition. They want to be a doctor. They want to be a teacher. My ambition is to be a bride. I just feel like <laughs> that the sole purpose of my life was just loving Jesus and pursuing the beauty of who he is and so that was really the time where love was awakened and when you behold him and when you truly see God for who he is it is impossible for it not to transform you or change you in any other way so when love was awakened I felt like the veil of shame was removed and I I, I just felt like I started to change as well as a person that I started to see myself in a very different eye. And it was also between the ages of 19 to 20 where I, it wasn't just love that was put awakened inside of me and purpose was awakened inside of me as well. And a passion that I've never had, a zeal that I felt like I've never had. So between the ages of 19 and 20, there was uh, two very huge, significant things that happened in my life as well. So I came from Kermaman, from a very small town. But when I was in college was when I was introduced to the idea of a world that I have never seen before. And that was the world of sex trafficking and human trafficking. And being at the age of 19, I made up my mind that this is what I am going to do, that I am going to live to set women free, that this would be what I pursue after. And so uh, during that time when I was still in college, it, I would, it was then Irene Fernandez was uh, the president of the Naganita. And I remembered that at every single event that they had, talking about human trafficking, sex trafficking, I would be there. I would drag a friend and I'm like, come on, let's, let's go do this. I, we're going to pursue this together. And sitting through each and every single talk, listening to what is the condition that is happening to these women. And I remember that there was once, there was this counsellor, this woman that was working with the Naganita. And she was sharing about the reality of victims that was rescued from sex trafficking or human trafficking. And that this one thing that she said just started to make me realize that maybe it wasn't as simple as I thought it would be. And so she just said that a lot of this victim, after they have been rescued from sex trafficking or rescued from being trafficked, they cannot face the horror and the trauma that 
has happened in their lives and a lot of them end up taking their own lives or that they would go back to their old way of living. And when I heard that, I said, no way, that's not going to happen. Like I, I like God, you're going to teach me how <laughs> this is not going to happen. But when I finally came to that place where I realized that as much passion, as much fire and as, as much conviction that I had, I was powerless to do it was uh, during one of the events. Uh, one of the days, me and my friend, my college friend, then we were walking to the LRT station and on our way there, I suddenly saw that there were just, it, it was a very dark corridor and I saw that there were two men and there was just a young girl, maybe at the age of 13 or 14. And when I saw it, they were actually negotiating the price between the customer and the guy. And I could just remember the fear that was in the face of this young girl. And I just froze because I didn't, I didn't know. It's one thing to hear about it, but it's another thing to see it right in front of your eyes. And I just froze at that time. My friend, she pulled me and quickly we ran away. And at the LRT station, when I stood, I was stunned by what had happened. And my friend just said to me, Sai Rebecca, don't worry about it. La. There's nothing we can do about it. This is life. And so that was one of the events that completely, I have made up my mind and I even said that God, I'm going to be the voice to the voiceless. I'm going to speak up. But that event, when I left, it helped, it left such a huge mark in my heart that the enemy accused me, you see, you say that you can do it. And that I began to just realize that I should just shut up because I have no power to change this. And so then I thought to myself, I can't save women. Now I will go and save children, which I don't know why it was a good, I, it, it felt like it was a good idea then. I then went and volunteered with a uh, voice of the children doing advocacy work for children, stateless children, you know, again, with that same fire and with that same passion of, yes, I can do this. And uh, again, I realized that with advocacy work is that you can say all that you want. And it, it sometimes feels like no one at all is hearing what you're saying. And one time me and my colleagues, we were all sitting together and we were reading through journals of children that were in prison. And I, I was reading this one journal of this particular boy that was put in prison because he killed his dad for hitting the mom. And I remembered reading that journal. And in that journal, he, he because there were Christians that went in to actually counsel them, to help them. So he was saying about the joy that he had of receiving Christ and knowing God has accepted him and had forgiven him. But he then mentioned that he is trapped in this anger that he was in and he felt like there was nothing that he, he just felt like he had this anger, so much of the anger inside of him that he feel like he could just kill himself. And so when I read that again, that thought, that just that feeling of powerlessness came over me and I realized that there is completely nothing that I can do about the situation. And so upon encountering Jesus for who he is, where that veil was lifted, where that shame was lifted, it was very quickly where that veil of shame came again. And I realized that not only can I not be, I can't even do as well. And so I just spent the next seven years after being completely lost in the wilderness, trying to find myself and trying to find the voice which I felt like I have lost. And so it, it was 
all the all the time when I was doing that, I was in Hanayo's office, and then I was in Epic with that disguise and under the cover of I can fake it till I make it. And but I was just looking and asking God to just save me from this place of being completely lost and not knowing what I was doing and crying out that God would just fix me from the brokenness that I was in. And it was just that journey that I went on, that survival mode. And all the while when I was in my father's house still, I didn't leave, like I didn't leave God and all those sort of things. But it was as if I was in my, I was in my own father's house. But I just said to him, it was that type of mentality where I'm unworthy to be your daughter. I'm just really unworthy to be anything at all. Just make me a slave and I would serve you. And therefore, I just went on with life with that slave mentality of just trying to survive and trying to hide the pain that I was in. And my heart was just getting very, very cold. I don't really feel things because I numb them because of the pain and the stress that I would go through. So it was living like this for about seven years. And until the age of 27, that was when God started to sort of alert me about a change that was going to take place. And this time around, I was actually in Singapore. And it was during a conference, a Burning Heart, a House of Prayer conference. And during this conference, the pastor that was being that was standing in front, he was actually a missionary. And he was sharing about the new movement of what God is doing and how he's using women, raising up women that according to his calculations, there were about four out of five missionaries, all of them were women, and they are placed not on a stage, but in one of the in, in the most harshest and most difficult conditions of the world, and they are serving the Lord. They are given their lives to serving Jesus, forsaking marriage, forsaking comfort, forsaking everything of their lives to serve God and giving their everything. So it was during this time when the speaker was say, was speaking in front, I suddenly felt like God was pulling my attention and he was just showing me that his hands went into the deep soil and he was uprooting something. And he just said to me, Rekha, I'm going to bring you through a process of complete uprooting. And that time I just really didn't quite understand what that meant. And the scariest thing to me was losing my job. I was thinking, oh God, are you, does that mean that I'm going to move location? Does that mean that I'm going to not have my job? That kind of thing. But after he said that, he didn't continue on revealing to me what was going to take place. But at that point, I was already sort of feeling it in my heart that I need to align myself in preparation for what God was going to do. And it was moving into year 2020 that I finally began to realize that God was transitioning me and I was transitioning out of where I was, the place that I was working in, the city that I was living in, and He was transitioning me out. And I thought, that he was transitioning me to the US. And because I was like, you know, for seven years, I have stayed, God, I just, I just really want to go to a different place to sort of just figure out this journey and to find myself. But instead, it was um, the last week towards uh, February 20, uh, 20th, towards before the MCO, lockdown, all of that happened a few weeks before God began to speak to me and it was out of the vision, out of a vision that I had. And during that vision, I was just walking around. I said, God, you show me what is it that you want me to do. You show me specifically, God. And when I was walking and I was just praying, I was speaking in tongues, not really particularly doing anything. All of a sudden, it felt like I saw an open, open vision where I saw the map 
of Malaysia right in front of me. And it was dark at first, but then there started to be lights in different places. It started in Sabah and Sarawak. And it came all the way, like little dots that began to light up. But as the light began to light up, I suddenly realized that there was a pause. Because as it reached the East Coast area, it was not lighting up. And so I waited for a while. And I was like, why, why is it not lighting up? Because it was a circuit. It, it, it felt like it was a circuit that was going on. And the circuit needs to go on to continue. But then it stopped at East Coast. And I just felt like the Lord said to me that the fire on the altar would die down if the younger generation are not there to continue on the work that has been done. And I just felt that fear that came upon me. And at that time, I still didn't know that it was like I was going to be sent home. And I just, at that moment, came to that realization. I said, God, I'm going to pray and I am going to be so serious about fasting for you to send people back. Like, God, you know, like, I'm, I'm so serious about it. Yes, I understand what you're saying. You're sending people to the East Coast. And God just said, I'm sending you back to the East Coast. And... At that point, I was just so stunned when God said that. And I said to God, I said, God, no way you can send me back home. You knew what I have escaped from. And you knew that I have spent nine years of my life trying to fix the mess that was in the past. And now you want me to go back to where I've started, God, I haven't even recovered from the things that I have lost back then. And you're sending me back. And God just said to me, Rebecca, you obey me. You go back. And you will see me begin to restore everything that you have lost. And it is not over the years. It is back in your childhood. I will give you back the voice that you have lost all that while. And so that began that journey of me making my way back home. And in that journey of making my way back home, I was actually making my way back to the heart of the Father. And that was that restoration. And that was that need for me to go back to confront the things that I had not been able to confront and didn't feel that I had the strength to confront. And it was there where God brought that closure into my heart, where there has been that place where the enemy has come in and robbed me of the things that I couldn't, and then rebuilt me by first tearing down everything. And so uh, today, as I was just sitting with the Lord over the past few weeks, I was asking God, I thought you wanted me to talk about the house of prayer. Why are we talking about all this? And I just felt like the heart of the Lord was just saying to me, tell my children to come home. Tell my children to come home to me and to be restored to my heart and to be restored to that place of first love again. And I just, over the past few months and over the past few weeks, have been hearing over the past few years, actually, but over this past few months, that urging of that sound of the Father asked my children to come to be restored to me. And I just, um, and I will share why I felt like, I felt like the Lord was just saying that. Because even as Auntie Grace was sharing yesterday, where we were having our time of prayer, of coming together, and she's just saying that we're living in this place right now where we have no answers to the things that we are going through, to the pain, to the disappointment and the things that we do not understand. 
And we need to anchor ourselves that we need to truly know that even during this time, God is calling us back to his heart, back to that place to be restored. Because only when we fully are in that place where we know that God, despite of whatever it is that we're going through right now, the challenges that we're facing is the heart of the father that is calling out to his children, return to me, come to me. You won't be able to do this by your own strength let me be the one to help lead you through this journey let me be the one to hold you and i just want to tell you that whatever pain it is that you're going through and maybe it is not physically moving to a location but we all have the areas in our lives where we have been hurt and that has sent where we have been hurt, where there have been deep disappointment, deep loss, whatever it is that we have gone through in our own lives. And God is inviting us to that place where he will show himself to be enough in our place of lack. And that is um, one thing. And the second thing about being the house of prayer is it is never about what we can build and it is never about what we can do for the Lord. But it is about us being his manifested presence. It is about us hosting his presence and allowing ourselves. It is out of the desire of our hearts to know that God, you long to be with us. God, you long to dwell with us. Even right now, God, where we are asking questions of where are you in the midst of all things, is your desire to encounter us. And only will we live in that place of reality, of knowing how we are loved and that hope that anchors us where we receive is going to make us become the manifested presence of God in the face of this earth. That we are the ones that carries that hope. It is Him in us that enables us to go out and as the darkness increases, as the sorrow increases, we are the one that carries that hope. The intercession is really not an action of what we do, but it is what we carry forth to invite God. God, I want to carry your heart. God, I want to carry your message. God, help me be the one that even as you restore and even as you um, restore me and even as you bring me to that place of oneness with you, God, that help others to experience you as well. And so, yeah, that is really my sharing for today. And I just, yeah, thank you so much for allowing me to just share with all of you. Mm. Thank you so much, Rebecca Joy, for sharing that. Um, I think you can keep your mic unmuted. We'll be uh, taking questions. Um, okay. Yeah, that was... Uh, very moving story. <laughs> After already hearing that, I had my 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 tissues on hand, and I saw you controlling your emotion. Um, would you share with us? Uh, you said you grew up in a Christian home, but then you say you only knew the Lord. Um, uh, almost in your twenties. Can you tell us a little bit of how you came to know Jesus? I think. For me, for people like us that have grew up in a Christian family, there are two, we can know him here. And until that it becomes a reality and experience for us, until it really drops into our heart, it would still remain that idea. It would still remain about an idea. So I think it really became the reality for me when my heart truly encountered who he is in that dark and desperate place was how I felt like, oh, this is it. This is real for me. Yeah. So help us understand, um, is it difficult to bridge that, that head knowledge and the, the heart knowledge uh, especially if you you 
supposedly knew Jesus even from a very young age, you know, um, how do we move beyond just knowing? Um, you say knowing. Yeah, that is a very good question. So I feel like God uses everything. And one of the things that he uses in different areas of our lives, how he encounters us, it's not this, the, the way he encounters me is very different from the way that he encounters you. And for me, it was through the way of brokenness and it's through the way of desperation. And sometimes for a lot of us, when we reach that place where we are faced with a challenge or whatever it is, I think the first impression or the first thought that comes into our mind is that I need to get rid of this desperation or I need to get rid, get myself out of this very painful situation. But I think a lot of times, God really encounters us through that place, that, that encounter, he encounters us from that place of where he knows, where there is a place where we cry out to him. And it is during that place, like for me, it was reading the word of Song of Song. Someone, it is when they are very sick and God healed them. So there's just so many ways that God encounters our hearts. And for me, it is through that story of my life that he encountered me. But it's not that limitation of, oh, you must have that kind of life or you must have gone through this kind of things. Then only God can encounter you. Because I know people as well who might not have gone through the experiences that they have gone through, but the love that they have for God as well and the way that God encounters them is equally as real. And I think that it is sometimes uh, the desire of us as well to seek him out. Like, as I seek you, I would find you. You know, that, uh, as I seek the Lord, he will reveal himself to me. And, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just, um, just to everyone, um, you don't need to raise your hands to ask questions. Uh, I'm sorry, we won't be unmuting you to ask questions. If you could just type your questions in the chat, we'll pick it up um, as we go along. Um, so you can do that. Uh, just type it in the chat, your questions for Rebecca Joy. Um, speaking of Rebecca Joy, that is your given name or birth name. <laughs> if you can tell us about that. Okay. Well, did someone ask that question? That's so interesting. So Rebecca Joy is not my real name. My, my real name is Rebecca and I, I'm Chinese, by the way. I have a Chinese surname. But Joy is that name that I really wanted. Like Joy was, I really wanted to just experience what Joy felt like. And so I really asked the Lord for a name. Like I said, God, just give me another name. And then I just decided that, you know what, I'm just going to put Joy. So like a few weeks ago, actually, when someone, um, my father, spiritual father from the House of Prayer, Penang Hall. So he prayed for me and he said something that was so interesting and profound. He's like, your name is correct. You know, Rebecca Joy, it is for the joy that is set before him, that he endured the cross. And therefore you have to endure a lot, but the joy would be there. And so, <laughs> yeah, I think that is when we, the identity of who God has given us, it sometimes requires us to grab a hold of it and be like, joy is going to be my portion. Peace is going to be my portion. And I'm going to grab a hold of that. I might not necessarily understand it right now, but God, I'm going to hold on to that name. And as I journey along, you're going to turn me into that. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Nia said Jesus is the best renamer. She yeah. Yeah. If you could answer her question, she asked, um, how do I return to God when I'm still full of fire for him but can't seem to believe for big things for myself, but I can for others, but I can't believe for myself due to disappointment. So you talk a lot about the disappointments in your life and the brokenness. Mm -hmm. So how, how can one return to God and can't even though we can't seem to believe for ourselves? Yeah, Mia, I think... One of the things that I've learned in this journey is that trust is a process and belief is a process. I think for every one of us, where God has given us a promise, 
sometimes we go through many, many years and we don't even see that promise coming to pass or that, God, I really want to believe in you. Why are you not revealing to me? I want that encounter. I I, I really want to know you, God, how do I return to you? And that is when the confidence that we have do not so much lie on ourselves, but it is the confidence of God knowing when it is the timing to bring us to him. Think like, you know, the story of Peter. It's one of my favorite stories that Peter was so confident in his ability that when Jesus told him that you're going to betray me three times, Peter was very, very confident in his love. Peter was so confident in his love for Jesus that he said that, Jesus, I will not betray you. But when that moment of betrayal came, he realized that I cannot believe. And out of his love, really, his desire to love God and to do everything that he could, he realized that there was a moment where he could not. And I think a lot of times where we try our best to reach God and we feel like we can't, that is when we rely on his faithfulness instead of ours because we will reach moments where we feel weak. Because for me right now, I might be like, oh, I really believe in God. I have the encounter with God. But when something happens, a tragedy hit or whatever it is, that time, again, I would not be able to fully rely on my understanding because experiences and all those sort of things, sometimes we have that encounter, but we forget as well. And then we go back to that place again of, God, where are you? Are you even real? But that is when his love would be sufficient for the journey that is needed ahead. So when I reach that place, which is very often, where I realized that, God, I don't even know. I tell, I tell you, the prayer that I pray more often than not is, Jesus, you help me not to betray you because the times that we're living in with the challenges that we go through, that the heart of many will grow cold and we will fall away. I don't have that confidence in myself or the experiences that even I've had in the past to help me go through, who knows what's going to happen. But I would just pray, Jesus, you know you are the one that holds me. And I think it was somewhere in the book of John as well, where Jesus prayed, and you know, Father, I, where Jesus prayed that you have given them to me and I've kept them, Father, now keep them from the evil one. So if you come before God and just be like, my love is weak, it's there, but it's weak, I think you're in the right phase because none of us are actually fully in that phase where we get it, you know, and we're mm-hmm. very confident we need to be, be careful. <laughs> it's when we're really too confident where we need to. Yeah, we're too confident of ourselves. Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. Confident in the one who holds on yeah. to us. I, I, I understand what you say. I have been through the times where I say, God, I cannot hold on to you. You better hold on to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question from Becky. Um, and anyway, everybody, if you have questions, please post it in the chat. I will pick it up. Um, there are some who are asking about the House of Prayer, and we have posted a link to a YouTube video where you can uh, know more about the Shiloh House of Prayer. Um, so you can watch that. Uh, you can copy the link and watch that later. Um, so there's a question from uh, Becky Lum. You grew up in a Christian home, right, uh, Rebecca? So she asked, is there something Christian parents shouldn't do uh, or didn't do to help their children grow their faith? Is there something Christian parents shouldn't do or should do, I think, to help their children grow their faith? Okay. I think one thing that we must know and understand as well is that just because we're Christians doesn't mean that we're perfect. We struggle as well but when especially when we have area brokenness we enter into marriage or we enter into children not with that mindset that i'm going to enter into marriage and i'm going to destroy it or like i'm going to have children and i'm going to destroy their future it is not that way my parents love me a lot my parents love me But that doesn't mean that they didn't struggle with their area of brokenness. And also because I I was a person that was very, very used to keeping secrets. And the reason for my brokenness as well was because 
there were certain things that I didn't tell them. Maybe when I would have told them, they would have been able to help me, but I didn't. And yeah, one of those things that really happened and why I struggled so much as a child was that I was sexually abused. And my parents never knew about it. For two decades, they never knew about it. It was my decision, actually, because I wanted to protect them. So I didn't want them to know what it was that happened. So you can't really pinpoint to be like, I, I know Christian parents who have done everything right. Or at least they have, they have tried their very best to do things right. And things just happen that the children choose paths that are completely different. And so it is, we can't so much as to, yes, parents have a role to play. But I realized that part of my brokenness as well, that I blamed it so much on my parents that I did not take personal responsibility for me being broken. Because when you're a child, you're like, yeah, those things happen. But as an adult right now, I'm like, okay, yeah, I know that there were things in my family that perhaps were not perfect. But now it is up to me that to make that decision that will I allow this brokenness to continue to control my life or that I will walk into the freedom that God has already given to me. So it's very brave of you, Rebecca, to share what you just shared with us. Um, I think statistically, we know that um, there are increasing number of abuses, especially among mm -hmm. girls. Um, and we never know when and where that can happen. Um, thank you for sharing that. So for somebody who might have gone through something similar or any brokenness that, that caused this um you, you talked about, you know, um, not being comfortable and hating yourself and all that. Are there something practical, uh, some things practical that maybe you advise somebody on how to break through? Um, besides, you know, talking to your parents, um, but if they can't or they feel they're... they're how would you advise them? I think first of all, for you to be able, again, it is a process. For some people, it might take so much more longer. For me, it took about two decades. But for some people, maybe they are like in their 60s or they are in their 70s and still there are things that has happened in their lives but they're not able to talk about. But I feel that for me, that the moment I don't keep things in the darkness anymore and that I reveal it, is when that healing comes from me. Mm. And for a very, very long time, actually, it was in that subconscious mind of me that that has happened before, but I just can't talk about it. I, I, just, I just felt like it was so shameful. But the secrets we keep in our lives heats us up alive. Mm. And then you end up going into that place of even more losing yourselves in that. And I think for me, the courage that I have to speak about what I have gone through has been the courage that my friends have given to me in the way that they have loved and embraced me and the older generations as well. The mothers, the spiritual mothers that he had brought into my life, that they affirm me of my value. They affirm me of who I am even when I thought that I don't have that I, I, I can't, I, can, I cannot do it. And, and let me tell you as well, that when we share these things in our lives that are hard and very difficult, it brings breakthrough and it sets people free, even within our own family. So I, my mom is actually here. So I, for a very, very long time, just thought that I can't share with my mom, what has happened to me because I needed to protect her. But what happened was that one time my mom was going through a very, very difficult time as well. And so I, as the daughter, I was comforting her. And all of a sudden, I just felt like God was just saying to me, Rebecca, share with her what has happened to you. And when my mom was feeling very discouraged, I finally said to her, I said, mom, I know that you're going through a very, very difficult time. 
but I just want to let you know that actually this happened to me and God has redeemed you. God has redeemed and God has redeemed me. God has redeemed you. And we are redeemed people. Yeah, we still go through the challenges that we go through and all those stuff things, but it's different. Because we know that we can rely on him to be that good God and that faithful God. And from there, my mom completely changed. She just was like, oh. I I I, I thought initially I thought that I couldn't tell her because she wouldn't be able to handle it. But at the very right time where God wanted not just to set me free, but to set her free as well, it was that freedom that brought about that transformation inside of her. And now me and my mom, we don't walk, we have gone through brokenness, we've gone through things that we don't wish that it would have been a part of our lives, but we are so much more stronger because of that. And we just walk in that freedom that is made available to us yeah wow so yeah so basically it's like tell somebody you know break that that secret right Ah. the breakthrough Uh. and it happens in the family as well that that's why it's so powerful you know between daughters and mothers and daughters that what god wants to heal is not just oh it's just about me but then the healing that comes to me will be for the healing of my daughter in the future. And it will be for the healing of my mother as well. That is why it is never like, it's it's not just for one. It's for the generations that there is to come because God is really doing just such an amazing thing. And God has been doing amazing things in your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what I hear is, yeah, tell somebody, even as one person, and you talk about spiritual mothers and a community who loved you and affirm you. So we have to look for that as well, right? Or pray for God to bring those people to our lives. Um, I remember you were telling me, um, there are some things you hate. And hate is a very strong word. I remember you telling me, I really hate this. Mm. You want to share that? Yeah, I actually forgot what I told you. But uh, <laughs> I hate the lies, the lies. Of the yes. I hate the lies of the enemy. I hate that 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 the thing that he sets a trap for us and he makes us fall into it. And I feel like because of that, I am all out to break down that lie and to bring people and to tell people that get out of that darkness. Jesus has come to set the captives free and to heal the brokenhearted. And that is what is made available to us. But we need to recognize and to just really destroy that lie and that stronghold that enemy, that enemy has had us believe for so many years. The cycle of shame, the cycle of we're so powerless, we can't do this, we can't do that because of the past. If we're not our past, you know. Because if you truly believe, like if I, if I truly believe that Christ has redeemed me and I've died with him, that he would raise me, I will, I will be completely different. I will live a very different way. Though, of course, that is not like, oh, immediately, you know, it, it goes through a journey. But as long as we are always in the place of God, I would return to you. Like I would, I would repent of having walked away from you, I will remember, God, who you are, your mercies and your goodness. I will remember your faithfulness and I will return to you. It is that same process over and over again. That, Yeah. Wow. I love it when you say that um, healing is not just for one person, but for mm. generations uh, before uh, generations to come. And speaking of that, what would you have to say to the younger women, what message do you have for them to bring up the next generation? I think actually for the young generation and the older generation, it is the same thing. That if we don't stand right now, if we don't choose to make a stand right now, and if we choose to just stay in that silence, in that place of being trapped and all those sort of things, the generation that is to come will reap the consequences of what we have sown. And I just, um, 
I just feel like even today I was I was seeking the Lord and I was like, God, what is it that you want me to pray? And he said, pray for courage for the women. I was like, I'll pray for courage. And what does what, what does courage mean? Is courage a feeling? And God said, no, courage is a commandment and it is a choice. It is that commandment to obey. When you hear, it is then your our choice to obey. So whether it is for the young and the old as well, because you could be thinking that, oh yeah, we want the younger generation to rise up. We want them to stand up. We want them to, but if the older generation is first not rising up, how do we expect the younger generation to? And that is why I actually, I think God has just put it in me such a heart to see the older generation flourish, to see the older generation rise up to recognizing that it is not too late. The time is now. Because I see that transformation personally taking place in my mom's life. Because they have gone through so much more in life, you know. And people usually just look and be like, oh, we're so excited about the younger generation. But I look at the older generation and I feel like I'm so excited about what God is going to want to do to your life because you've gone through so much more you have so much to offer to the younger generation wisdom that we don't have paths that we've never traveled to you have that perseverance you have all of that and it is time for you to share that with us the younger generation needs you to rise to where we need to be and so for the younger generation uh i would say that don't do this journey alone you need the wisdom of the older generation to lead you because like for me during that time, I think I didn't really have anyone to sort of tell me like, okay, Rebecca, this is how you should navigate through. I have a few, but not like a very close relationship. But in this past two years, my goodness, the, the cycle of my godmothers now is larger than the cycle of my friends. Because they are the ones that will be, Rebecca, I'm praying for you. Hey, Rebecca, you rise up. The enemy is lying to you. You know, you need to get up. You know, that kind of thing. And so, everything that we need is already given to us. And so, yeah, we're blessed. We have everything that we need, really. Yeah. <laughs> you answered the question that I hadn't asked you, which was how <laughs> women encourage the younger women. You, you encourage all the generations already. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have a, a question from Grace. Um, I believe many have sexual abuse, sexual identity issues. What is your advice to them to come into the light of this freedom and joy that you now know? For me, because when you go through that kind of experience, what you need really is that personal encounter. Because in my mind during that time, you can go for counseling and all those sort of things it really helps but if you have gone through that deep area of brokenness i think you need what i did was that i really prayed and i said god you help me to see myself as pure you help me to see myself as clean because i can know everything that i know about the steps to do it but unless i see it you know like thomas doubting thomas unless i see it and that revelation came to me only, I think, two years ago. But actually, I spent my whole entire childhood up to then feeling very dirty. I actually felt very guilty as well, you know, as a Christian. I felt very, very like, oh, I, I, I just felt dirty. Like, I was not right. There's something I'm... The, the term that always I would hear is, you're broken goods. You know, that kind of thing. But it was that revelation of Jesus and his blood and how he completely washed over me, that blood that covered me. It needs to be. I, my story can't be your story, but I'm telling you my I'm telling you my story so that you would go ask Jesus for your story. And for me, it was that revelation of the power of that blood. And knowing that Jesus took off his garment just to cover me, to cover my shame. And I, when I talk about it today, it just doesn't sting at all. It just doesn't. Because God has just so healed and redeemed me in that area. 
Um, we have, um, thank you so much. We have thanks from people who really um, affirm your courage in sharing your deepest hurt openly from Maya. He says, may the Lord grant you your heart's desire. Um, and Irene says, whether we are young or old, we are all precious to God and can use every yes. one of us. And Jesse says, amen. Older generation is, array is ready to rise up. <laughs> That's my mom. My mom is Jesse. Oh, she has okay. so rise up. I'm like, mom, COVID is not, COVID, you're not scared of COVID. COVID is scared of you. Because she's ready to take the street by storm with evangelism, bringing everyone to know Jesus. That is the potential. And I feel like the older generation, they are very, very blessed. Uh, no, they are very, they are very brave. Like they just go and everyone at every street knows about Jesus. So like, you know how amazing an instrument the older generation is to the kingdom of God. Wow. <laughs> um. <laughs> I feel like um, you answered all the questions I didn't ask <laughs> so much more I can be very long winded sometimes I'm like <laughs> yeah, I think everybody is so encouraged by your courage <laughs> and by your story and by bringing it up, um, into the light um, um, I think we have um, one question another one hmm. How do you now see your passions and how has it changed your approach versus the previous lives of the enemy? My passion is Jesus. <laughs> give me more Jesus. Like, give me Jesus. Yeah, but my, my passion is Jesus and everything that I do comes from the overflow of me wanting to desire, me wanting to pursue everything that he wants. And I think when we are, when I was young, I thought that what I should pursue, because people always ask, hey, what's your passion and what is your purpose? And I didn't know what was my purpose or what was my passion. So I just, it was, for me, it was just many years of, oh my goodness, I don't, what is my passion? How do, how do I explain to people? You know, I, not, I wasn't really interested in anything, but then I realized that my journey is kind of just different other people that my passion it sounds really funny and I'm just very different compared to other people but really Jesus is what gets me up it's what makes me do the watch night prayer <laughs> it is what makes me go into fasting and praying and doing all the sort of things and I wouldn't have it any other way because you can when you have tasted and seen the best of the best, nothing else could be able to satisfy. And everything else becomes very boring. <laughs> and so, yeah. Speaking of prayer, you said, um, what is the difference in becoming a house of prayer and building a house of prayer? Hmm. Becoming, building is... Uh, Wow, actually, I think a lot of times we unintentionally realize that our service to God is our doing. But it is never about you doing, it's about you being. Because when I do, I can be on a part-time where, oh, this is the only time where I go to the house of prayer. Or this is what I do. It, if, if it is just what I do and it doesn't change who I am, it is ineffective. I would still be maybe producing fruits where you look at me and be like, wow, so good, huh? you did this, you do that, you do this. But those are the fruits, right? Where it does not change people's life. It does not bring about transformation. And Jesus, if, if, if I give to Jesus that type of fruits, he also want to throw away. But being is about me being that living sacrifice. It is not, the, it is not me singing a short song. It is me being worshipped to him. It is in everything that I do, I give myself to him wholeheartedly. Because you can do a lot for Jesus. That's why I did a lot for Jesus. And then I realized what was all of that. Because I sometimes do things in a very wrong spirit. You know the elder brother spirit where you do for the father and actually you have an account of the things that you've done for him, expecting as well the blessings to... <laughs> I did this, God, you remember I do this? Where is the blessing for this? That kind of thing. 
but when you carry that spirit of God, I am, I become that. It then becomes about Him instead of what I do. I have no need to perform. I have no need to go and be anything that I'm not. Mm. I just God, this is me. Let my life be that worship to you. Let me carry intercession in my womb that I would feel the very things that you feel. I would grieve over the things that you're grieving over and all that. So I think we need to come to that place of becoming instead of doing. Because mm. if we think that ministry had been the key to bring about transformation and change or whatever it is, there's so many people that are falling away from church. So many people that are turning away from their faith because they just simply, you know, the strongest of us would fall. But it is only until you become that very, becoming is when God becomes one with me. I'm one with him that I would be able to, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. doing just tires you out, what for? So exhausted because of all the doing. <laughs> just, yeah. I remember people often saying, you know, remember we're human beings, not human mm -hmm. wings, right? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Rebecca, I, I'd like to ask you about the books you have uh, written and um, everyone, excuse me, but I must do some promotion for her. This is an amazing young lady who's already published one book. I'm going to share screen um, of the book. Oops, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, okay. Um, while well, I'm looking for where it is. <laughs> um, can you tell us about the, the book that you have already published? Yeah, so um, in my attempts to want to see Jesus, I started painting uh, last year when the MCO started. And then I wrote two books. The first is Crossover and the second is Breakthrough. And I think a lot of that story came from reading the book of Exodus mm -hmm. where when God brings us out of Egypt into the promised land, it is a process that we have to go through. But in it is God's heart that continuously is asking, calling us out of that place. Like, get up, come up. And these two books came from that revelation of that place of, God, I still feel that I am in this place of being in the wilderness but I see and I believe that the promise is ahead of me. So Crossover was last year and Breakthrough is this year. I think the message is just, it's sort of similar, but Crossover is more from that place of Exodus, Egypt to the wilderness. And I feel like Breakthrough is more of the wilderness and preparing us for the promised land. Mm. The Joshua generation that needs to rise up and be the light at this hour. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I managed to find it. It's up on screen. Everybody, I hope you can see the uh, front and back of the two books, Crossover and Breakthrough by Rebecca Joy. It's only 28 ringgit per copy and um, she'll pick, mail it to you, a courier of postage, 7 ringgit. So that's only 35 ringgit. Um, Rebecca Joy, you gave your number there. So uh, I guess the orders would be by texting you, calling yeah. you. Yeah, you you I, I will reply you 10 days later because I'm doing the 40 days. <laughs> I will reply you 10 days later, but yeah, you can text me or if you just, you know, want to share your story or if there's anything that I can um, enlighten you with, you can contact Ooh. me. Oh, so people can call you, text you. With this I, will re I will reply 10 days later. 10 days later but, yeah. but yeah, you can, you can. I... I'm available. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to later type uh, the your phone mm. number. I've already stopped screen share. Yeah. The phone mm. number chat if anybody wants to uh, contact Rebecca Joy for the book mm. um, or as Rebecca said, uh, for encouragement or praying. 10 days later though, you said, right? Um, so any last word you you think you need to tell somebody here tonight if you feel that 
You can look right at the camera and speak right at the moon. What? I, I'm sharing, is it? Yeah. Um, I think I would just tell you that you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to do this alone. First of all, there are intense moments that we will go through and we will be facing and if we haven't yet, it might be coming. But this time that we have is the really that time of preparation. We don't want to be digging wells when we're already at that point of dying of thirst. Before it happens, we want to be digging well. And even in that phase of like wilderness, that God could really bring forth that spring of waters. And sometimes it really happens in the wilderness. So I would say, prepare yourself. When you come out of COVID, when you come out of this situation, whatever it's going to look like, I'm not saying that, you know, a prediction of whatever it is that is going to happen. You want to be a different person that can overcome and stand, that the storm is not there to take you out, but you will take, that you will rise up above it. And the empowerment of the Holy Spirit will be there to guide you. That even at this moment, you might be feeling just powers, powerless or just, I can't do this. But you don't rely on your own strength. We are moving on to that place of new wine skin. And the grace of God is there. Like, I will help you. You just cling on to me. You cling on to me. Read John 13 to John 17. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the promise that he's given to us in this hour. It is difficult time but it's one of the greatest hours for the army of light to shine so be a part of the army of light wow okay um i guess uh, there are some people who are asking how to get involved in the house of prayer i have already shared your phone number there i guess they can contact you through um your your phone your, uh, there's a whatsapp or call yeah right okay um i'd like to ask you to say a prayer um, was some I, I guess somebody was raising the hand, but um, we're not going to unmute you for your questions. <laughs> Even you raise your hand, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> type your questions um in the chat. Um, there's Rebecca Joyce number again. Hmm. Um, yeah, we we have a lot of encouraging uh affirmations from everybody about your sharing. They have been so moved and so hard. And so encouraged. And thank you very much for sharing. Thank you so much for allowing me to share. Yeah. And so authentic. I think I saw somebody say that. So everybody, if you want to know more about the House of Prayer or uh, get Rebecca's uh, two books, please contact her at the number that was given. Um, and I'm going to ask Rebecca Joy to pray for all of us. Hmm. Father, we just come before you today, God, and I just want to thank you, oh Lord, and I just want to release, oh God, that whatever it is that you have given to me, oh Lord, the healing from that place of break, barrenness, oh God, and walking into that place of breakthrough, God, I pray that over each and every one of my sisters here, God, because, Lord, the past no longer defines us, oh God, that when we choose you, everything is different about our lives. And Father, I pray for courage right now, for us to understand that, Lord, courage is not a feeling that comes, that we wait for it to come. Courage is sometimes, oh God, hearing your commandment and choosing to do it afraid. And I pray for my sisters right now, God, that they would do that, for we are made for hard things, God, because we have a God that goes before us, goes ahead of us, and goes behind us. And God, we don't have that excuse to be afraid anymore because your perfect love has cast out every fear and every excuse that we have so that, Lord, we would be able to walk into the destiny that you've given to us. And really, Jesus, you are our destiny. So I ask that today, Lord, your daughters will walk into the destiny that you have set for them. And Lord, you, Jesus, be their dream, you be their destiny, you be the fit, you be the one at the finishing line that we would run this race with courage of God. And I ask that love would anchor them and keep them in the vision you have, which you have prepared for them. So I pray for courage to arise. God, I pray that they would recognize their identities as the daughter of the lion of Judah. And I ask the Lord that you would give them the raw in your hearts. 
to rise up to the hour in which you have called us into. So, Lord, we thank you, God. Oh, Jesus, you're so good. We thank you. So I bless each and every single one of us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your heartfelt sharing, Rebecca Joy. Um, again, anybody who wants to know more about uh, the House of Prayer or want to order books, please just contact her through her number given in the chat. But she'll only reply after the 40-day fast and prayer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm next going to uh, pass the time, the few minutes more we have to uh, our chairperson of the NECF Women Commission, uh, Grace He. And uh, also, uh, we're going to take a group photo, right? Yeah. Grace? Okay, Rebecca, you awed me, and I'm sure you awed everyone. Uh, you prayed about courage. I think you are the most courageous person in this room right now. Uh, thank you so much for, for just exposing yourself to us. Um, everyone here, uh, you know, is very privileged to hear your story. And you are truly, like I mentioned a few times to you, you're one of those uh, young generation that the Lord has raised from Malaysia. And I'm so glad that you obeyed the call. I know great things be, uh, are ahead. And uh, so my husband has this, uh, the best is yet to come. <laughs> and that is very true of you. I want to pray for you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, poured out yourself to us. And I just want to uh, release a pour in for you. Thank yeah, you. Let, let everyone just stretch out your hand so we can pray for Rebecca. Bless her for all that she has done in the name of the Lord. Father, I just thank you for Rebecca, your daughter. You have raised her up as truly a daughter of destiny. And you have called her even while in her mom's womb, oh God. Lord, the things that happened to her, Lord. Father, in every moment you were there for her. And that you have led her, Lord. Lord, even to this moment. I pray and thank you, Lord, that your hand will never leave her nor forsake her. But this courage that you're building in her, Lord, will continue to grow and grow and grow, Father. That indeed, she mentioned the roar of the Lion of Judah will, will come forth even with greater might that will defeat every works of the evil one. Father, you gave her such a passion for the oppressed, and those that are downtrodden. And I know that in the days to come, you will use her. It's not, it's not a past, but it is a future. And so I pray, oh God, that you slowly but surely, Father, lead her by your gentle hands, oh God. Lord, to cause her to see and behold the things that you can do with one daughter whose heart is set on you. So I thank you for Rebecca. Lord, bless her. Pour into her. Because she, even more than she has poured out, pressed down, shaken, shaking, overflow. Lord, her portion, Father, of the blessing. We thank you for her, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen Rebecca. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so for everyone. Welcome everyone. For those of you who have never been to the House of Prayer and have never seen it before, so today I just want to bring you on a tour to just see what shine. This is when you come on in, you will realize that this is usually the hall of the place that we use for our worship session and our gathering session. So almost every week or so we meet up here in this place, just time of coming together, worshiping and praying. And it's just yeah, we have everything that we need here. We have the piano, we have the guitar, so all the instruments that we need are found here in this house. And uh, this is a wall that I have sort of just over the past year 
one of the things that the Lord has really put in my heart to do when I started this House of Prayer was that I was to have a record of all the vision and all the words that He's given to me to just sort of write it down on the wall and to remember it. And therefore, this will is just for the purpose of remembering all the words that God has spoken on days when I feel very discouraged or sort of be wondering, God, what is it that we're doing here? And this is just a wall of remembrance so that when people come in as well, they could have a clearer understanding of the purpose for this house and the reason for it. And here um, we have a painting that I have drawn and I just uh, just want to show you that this is perhaps one of the most significant pieces of this house and this was the name of the house which is called Shiloh and so initially when God gave me the name of this house Shiloh I actually didn't understand what it meant and I actually have to google the meaning to see what the name of Shiloh represented and this is a piece that was actually given by uh, one of my spiritual mothers that's all the way in Sabah um, I call her Mama Sandra and she found out one day that the name of the house of prayer was called Shiloh and she immediately called me up and she said that I have a gift that I wanted to give to you and little did I know that this piece um, that we have right here was a piece that she had kept for the past seven years because initially when God gave her that name and she was like wow this is such a really beautiful name and God revealed to her that the name of Shiloh is an oasis that it is a place where people who are thirsty would find rest and they would find restoration and refreshment and so seven years later she gave me uh, this piece and this is now uh, one of the most memorable pieces in this house and right now I'm just going to show you across this room and just some of the stories here and there um, of this house so um, here we have um, our dining table so we don't just come here to pray and to worship together but we have fellowship as well where we just come and we just do life together um, and these are just a few pieces of the initial stages when God was telling me what this house of prayer was about um, there are three prophetic paintings that are drawn the first one is of a lighthouse and I just felt like God was just saying that that this that what he wants to do here is that he wants to cause light to come in that place of darkness where people would recognize that hope and the light that is in Christ and what we're doing here is that we're simply building this place up offering worship and prayer to the Lord so that his light will come into this land and that all may see and know who Jesus Christ is and um, this picture of an eagle was uh, a picture that I drew one day when I was feeling very, very discouraged and and I was praying, the Lord was asking me to just prophesy over this house, to just prophesy over this land and I was cl closing my eyes sort of in tears when I was praying and all of a sudden like when I opened up my eyes and when I suddenly looked up, I just saw two eagles that was just flying across this house and so I don't really know what is the meaning of that yet but it was just something that I saw and the Lord wanted me to just paint this and this picture here is I think really the story of what this house is about of what the Lord was showing me that this is a place of a womb where the Lord is preparing like when children they are born prematurely they go into an incubator and where there is a process of nurturing and preparation that goes on and this is sort of the heart of the house where God is calling for his children to just be in his presence to just receive everything that he has to give for us and then coming to a place of recognizing who we are of finding healing and restoration and being ready to face whatever it is that the challenges in our lives that the Lord has for us to go through and so now I'm going to bring you upstairs to our guest room that we have prepared so yeah and yeah we have bookshelves as well where we have tons of books for people that want us to read and So this is our guest room and um, 
one of the things that I felt very was very significant and the Lord wanted really wanted me to do was just to prepare a place where for people who wants to visit, for people who just wants to find rest and they just need that refreshment, they could just come to this place and they could just um, seek the Lord and they would have a place to stay and sort of a resting place. So I just want to take this time as well to just share a little bit of testimony of the story behind this house of prayer and what was it that the Lord has revealed to me. So. Um, Last year, I remember somewhere in, in the in the year twenty twenty, I was in the Penang. I was in Penang House of Prayer, staying with one of my family there from the House of Prayer, and the Lord began to really confirm it in my heart that this was what He wanted to build a house of prayer. And I remember feeling just so overwhelmed by the whole idea where I didn't felt like I had one take, I had no experience and I had no idea what was it that I was going to do. And I was coming before the Lord, really crying in tears. And I said, God, I am not like the other people. I am not like the rest of them. I have no experience. I just can't do this. And I felt like the Lord just said to me, hold up your hands and what is in your hands. And when he said that, I understood what he meant because a few months prior to that, the Lord was speaking in my heart and stirring in my heart where I would feel like the Lord was just looking around to find ones that would be faithful. And I could hear the, the voice of the Lord almost hovering over the land and he was saying, can I find people who are faithful? Can I find people who are faithful? And that was when my heart began that there was just the stirring that the Lord has placed inside of me in the heart of King David where when he has built his own house and there was a sentence in the grief that was in his house because he knew that the Lord did not have a resting place and I began to just feel like God I just want you to have a resting place. I just want you to be in this place where you know that you are you are loved that you're adored and i just want that place for you and there were two things that god asked me fast forward to the day when i was crying to the lord and saying i have no idea what a house of prayer is do we do programs do we do worship what is a house of prayer and when the lord asked me to put out my my hands and ask me what is it that you have there were two things that he said to me the one thing that he said to me was that do you have love do you have a love for me and are you willing to love? And the second question, uh, the, the second thing that he gave to me was that I only need you to feed my sheep and that this house, the foundation of this house is going to be built upon the tears and the desire of you to create a home and a dwelling place, not just for me, but for the ones that would come in. And I think that is really the story of what this house is about. It is not the programs, it is not the hours of worship, it is not all of that, but it is a place where we come and we soak this land, we soak this place with our tears, crying to the Lord out of the desire of our hearts to be with him and really his desire and the invitation of his heart to dwell in us. So this is the story of Shiloh and I hope that one day you could come and visit us as well in this place and yeah, that's it.